Hi, you're listening to the Modern Club Management Podcast with me, your host, Ed Chapman. This podcast takes the lived experiences and knowledge of some of the leading figures and thinkers from the world of club management and beyond, all so that they can become your teacher and elevate your performance. Whether you're looking to start a career in club management, are a seasoned club manager at a world leading club, or work elsewhere within this wonderful industry, there will be powerful messages and key takeaways that can help you in your career or personal life. Thank you for tuning in and I hope you enjoy today's episode. This episode is brought to you by Sweda. Sweda is the social learning platform that delivers high quality blended learning with human connection. Sueda is on a mission to revolutionize the digital learning space through restoring the critical element of human engagement that has gotten lost in online learning. The technology provides everything organizations or individuals need on one single platform to achieve meaningful long-term learning success. Using these skills helped me attain a job offer as the director of golf at Golf Digest Top 100 in the World Ranked Course after I completed their influence and communication courses but don't just take my word and the 97 percent five star reviews it has had on trustpilot for it try it yourself all you have to do is email david at suada.com that's s-u-a-d-a.com and quote the modern club management podcast to claim your free enrollment onto the reciprocity course to start your journey to become a more influential and persuasive communicator Welcome to the Modern Club Management Podcast with me, your host, Ed Chan. Today, I'm excited to be joined by Peter Papagnan. Peter is the General Manager of Commonwealth Golf Club on the famed Sandbelt in Melbourne, Australia. Pete, thanks for joining me today, and how are you going? Thanks, Ed. Um, going well, thank you. Yeah, yeah, no, going, going really well. Excellent. So, you've been at Commonwealth for about seven months or so now, and Prior to joining there, you were the general manager at Metropolitan for about nine years, another top club. But what was your background before that? And how did you get involved in club management? Yeah, thanks, Ed. I had a little stint um, yeah, prior to Metropolitan at another golf club, uh, Cranbourne Golf Club, for just over two years. And uh, but prior to that, yeah, my, my career was hospitality. So I, out of high school, I studied hospitality and, and then worked in a variety of different uh, fields in that space. So, you know, be restaurants and hotels and um, and then more you know, beverage style bars uh, and sort of carried off a variety of uh, different experiences, uh, which was which is really exciting as a as a young person. Um, look, during during those years, I also had a short stint at a, at a golf club and I just had a bit of a taste for, for golf and what that that environment was like. Um, but yeah, I think that things just coincided well with my studies, uh, other studies, which I went and did uh, a degree in marketing and hospitality complemented that really, really well. So um, yeah, I had a really good career in hospitality, ended up working for a couple of reasonable size hospitality groups. I uh, got into a more broader management um, and oversight of, of a number of venues towards the back end of my, my hospitality career, which gave me a good, good, really good insight into you know, you know, effective business management and um, you know, detailed policies and procedures that are required to, to have in place in, in running a big org- organization. So, yeah. So from there, it was uh, yeah. Then, then the switch was made to the to the club industry and the golf industry, which I was I was very fortunate to do. It was just at that point in in life with a with a starting up a young family and uh, something that was probably a little bit more conducive to to that was to um w- would be something like the golf industry and, and the club industry. So yeah, I was fortunate enough to get that opportunity at, at Cranbourne and um yeah, and then as you mentioned, after Metropolitan for a, a good stint and and now over at Commonwealth um for a very exciting uh, uh, part of Commonwealth's history that I'm very fortunate to to be a part of and um yeah we've got some big projects on the go that have just started and um, yeah, we're really expecting um, yeah, some really good results from those projects. And how do you feel the role of a general manager has changed in the sort of past decade or so that you've been doing it in golf clubs? Yeah, and it's quite appropriate. I think uh, 
it, you know, something we're working through at the moment with these major projects and, you know, we've talked about a lot about communication, you know, you know, building effective teams, but, you know, also but back to it, the communication element of, is something that um, it's just me. I've moved, things move so quickly and, uh, and I guess the, you know, powered by social media and the thirst for knowledge uh, and, and information and getting it as quick as, uh, as we can as consumers, and that's sort of filtering through to club, clubs in that environment so you know particularly when we're going through moments of change it's um you know there's there's a big responsibility on club management to to be planned organized and and communicating you know effectively and promptly uh all the plans at the club and um and the details and behind those plans so it certainly found that's probably been a been a substantial change in club management that um yeah we need to be you know like i said organized moving moving quickly um which is you know, probably not traditionally the way you know um, clubs have been historically and needed to be, um, but yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's you're certainly finding that to be a different part of the environment at the at the moment, and and, I, and something I don't, I don't think will change either. So building on that, if you could go back, knowing what you know now, to your first general manager role you had at at Cranburn, what advice would you give yourself? Oh well. Um, that's an interesting question. You know, I look, I, I probably, you know, yes, yes, it has moved a lot, but I, I think probably, you know, the thing for me is that I've, I've moved and, and I'm in different environments compared to where I started. So, um, yeah, I think it's, uh, you know, from the communication side, I think it's probably, I think probably something I've learned from myself and that's sort of been, you know, being in the system as well and it comes through the, the management experiences in hospitality, but then also getting to some bigger clubs, you know, the processes and, um, uh, and procedures is something that's certainly changed. And, uh, yeah, I guess that's probably learnings, isn't it? And probably the advice I would give to myself as a, as a younger manager. Um, I think, you know, more broadly management is, um, and to me, my younger self, I guess, coming from a, a hospitality environment that, that moves so, so quickly. Um, I talk about club yeah. management and change and, uh, and the, you know, the need for information and getting things out quickly. Well, you know, hospitality moved really quickly and it's a really competitive environment. So um, but I think I've found, you know, over the journey to my, again, go back to my younger self, but my first club management job, yeah, it's just it's probably um, people management is, is the one thing that I've, I've learned and, and learned through, uh, you know, being in a, in a really good industry. The club industry is fantastic, um, you know, and, uh, different hospitality but you know the structured training that's that's provided through our management association here in australia i think they, they do an excellent job uh in golf management australia and things i've learned through the club management um association of, of america attending their conferences uh yeah some of the things that i've found out through that you know people management has been is, is something that's really important and, and certainly flows flows through to today you mentioned you've got some exciting projects on at Commonwealth. So I believe that's with Renaissance Golf, the redesign project you've got going on. Uh, yeah, it is. Yeah. Look, at, in, incredibly exciting. Um, you know, we're really fortunate. It comes off a little beauty uh, here on the sand belt. And, um, and uh, you know, I don't like using the word hidden gem. Um, gets used a bit. It's, uh, you know, yeah. I think something for Commonwealth is. Um, yeah, you know, if we if we shrug off that tag and never be called that again in in a couple of years' time, I'll be I think we're I think we've achieved something. The um but it's it's certainly well regards a beautiful golf course. Uh it, it's it's um it's unique uh in in its design. Uh you know, it's something it's a course that's um you know, dear to the heart of, of Tom Doak, um, who wrote about it in his confidential guide and uh and that's that's you know, the beauty of being associated and working with Tom, who's been instrumental in the, in the establishment of the plan with, with Brian Slornick uh, that we're about to, or that we're currently executing at the moment. So, yeah, so it's, it's there's two, well, there's, there's a lot of infrastructure changes going on with, with new irrigation systems, but uh, aside from architectural works, we're, we're reconstructing our, um, all of our putting surfaces. Uh, we're taking it back to a, to a pure sand profile rather than being a, you know, a USGA spec uh, uh, you know we're just built on on a beautiful natural sand in um, 
environment a, a great property. So we're so we're, we're reinstigating that, and then just making some some minor changes with renaissance but um and we're breaking into two two phases uh, we're working through the first phase at the moment the second phase will start in in the growing season next year in august but the second phase is, has got some more substantial works and we're you know effective rebuild of of uh four holes um but interesting the rebuilds um, they're taking inspiration from our original uh, golf course which was laid out so we our first hole is going back to something very very similar um, what we had uh, prior to its reconstruction in the 90s. So um, so that's also an exciting project. So, yeah, there's subtle improvements, but you're really excited that we're going to see a, a substantial improvement in the golf course. And, um, you know, one, we'll have a great product, but, yeah, the second part of it will be the communication and the, and the marketing of it. And when I say the marketing of it, you know, I think that'll be largely done by our visitors. So, you know, we, you know, we look forward to welcoming them and, um, yeah, members will be introducing guests and just providing a great experience that will hopefully match a, a brilliant golf course that, that Renaissance Golf will, will construct for us. With those four holes that are being changed back to how they originally were, can you paint a picture of, say, the first hole and how that's going to look different? Am I right in thinking the first hole is a shortish par four with the green slightly round to the right? <laughs> Correct, yeah, yeah. It's... um. It's yeah, it's it's it would be shorties, but shorter. It's uh, okay. you know, approximately about twenty meters shorter, but uh, it's um, it will now become a little bit more drivable. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah, and for those seriously good golfers, it, it might be a three wood in the hand. Um, but you're yeah, bringing it, shortening the hole. Um, some of the some of the hazards are also going to be removed at the same time. So it'll, for the for the mid high handicappers, it um, it'll still be a an enjoyable opener was maybe not too much trouble off the tee, but that second shot is, is going to be quite a difficult one, and that's what that's part of the the charm of Commonwealth. That's um, that's that second shot to the to the hole is you know, certainly a challenging one throughout the golf course. Um, but the um, you know, sort of back to how it plays for the long hitters, at, at playing that little bit shorter, it's certainly going to entice them to take it on more than what they do now. But um, yeah, Brian, who's doing the shaping work, is uh, and, and the architectural work certainly got um, some plans in his mind to, to make it quite a challenge for for the golfers. Sounds yeah, a very exciting time at the club with all this going on. So, how are you working it in terms of the course being open for play, closed? How's all that working? Yeah, so the, look, we um. It certainly uh, created a lot of discussion to determine what was the best way of doing this and uh, you know we the, the plan was to, to do it and, and, it, and is the way in which we're doing it is uh, by doing it nine holes at a time uh, we had considered doing it all at once and certainly there's a portion of our membership that was very keen for us to close the course completely and um, and just get it done and get it done in one growing season but um, you know for a couple of reasons, Wow. Well, one, you know, trying to do it all at once with the weather conditions that we can face in Melbourne. Spring can be wet and cold. Uh, so trying to grow in 18 new greens and, you know, uh, cooch grass and, uh, you know, could have been one hell of a challenge and we, we, you know, we could have struck some trouble through the project. So we, we've, we've just felt it was more appropriate to be doing it nine holes at a time and, and um, and after consultation with the membership and getting their their views on it, uh, it's, it's, it was a position that the membership were also comfortable with as well. The majority of so um yeah we we set up a little um, on the southern part of our property. We've we've combined a number of um, well we've, we've done a, a bit of a different routing. Uh, we've still got eight greens in play, eight proper greens in play, uh, temporary. Uh, it's um, just running two tees, so it's you know, two loops of, of nine holes. Um, so members are still getting their, their 18 holes in. That's getting They can put a card in for handicap. Um, we've still got our first hole's not being constructed in this first phase, so it's being used as a little short course as well. So that's been a really good uh, eye-opener for us as well to be able to try some different things during this, this program. 
uh, and just to see how the members use such facilities as well. So, yeah, we've managed to find a, a reasonably good solution. Um, yeah, members have been understanding, probably rather than playing three games of golf per week, our regular golfers, they're playing two just to lighten the load. Um, you know, quite a few members are over in your part of the world at the moment, Ed, and um, enjoying a, a, you know, a golfing holiday in the UK um, or spending a bit of time in Europe. And um, so it's it's been manageable, um, and it'll be effective for the second stage of our our project as well. How long would these nine holes you're currently working on take to grow in and be reopened? Yeah, so we're, we're um, hoping to have them all seeded, and they'll be done in stages, but uh, all seeded by the end of October, and then we're allowing through to the end of. January for, for for the growing period, so so that's you know twelve weeks plus for some of the greens. So you know we're we're going to need some good growing conditions to to hit that, but we we expect that um, you know we're, we're going to be using grow cloth and uh, and every I guess every tool that we've got to try and advance the greens, um, it, you know, without you know pushing them too hard in terms of their growth phase. But um, but yeah, we're we're, we're confident we'll. Um, We'll hit our target date of, of the end of January, um, at which stage we'll, we'll reopen the entire golf course. Okay, so then they'll have about six months before then the next phase starts. Correct, yeah. And how, with the communication of members, is there a continual or regular update of the work and what's happening with it? Yeah, so we're, we're, since the project started, we're when we pre-planned and committed to doing weekly updates uh, for the members. So every Friday morning, uh, we've got a videographer that will come in and uh, with his drone as well, and we'll, we'll do some flyovers of, of areas that, are, that have been under construction uh, and then also spend three or four minutes, what well, ends up being three or four minutes of, of footage with our course manager just talking about the projects and what's happened over the, over the previous week and then giving them an insight into what's happening on on the following week. So the, um, yes, yeah, so that filming is that's Friday morning every week. We do that and then edit over the weekend and then publish first thing on, on Monday. So, so members are, um, are getting a quick update. As I said, it's, uh, it's you know, two, three, four minutes. Uh, we're keeping it short, sharp. Uh, certainly one thing I've learned with communication, uh, you know, it needs to be a little bit punchier nowadays to, to capture people's attention and, and make sure they consume all the content that we do send them. Yeah, if it's that two, three minute video, it's easy for them to click on that and watch versus a long one. And how's the feedback been with them getting those weekly updates? I imagine they'll be quite excited seeing the progress every week. Yeah, correct. And and look, the the construction team working on this project, the first the first two weeks have been, have been exceptional, and um, they've been moving really, really quickly. And uh, yeah, a comment from them has been, I "Can't believe so much has been done over the first." couple of weeks so so that's been really positive but it's a, it's a great way of giving them a, an insight into what's happening on the course uh we'll we'll support that with some course walks at uh at the appropriate time in the next few weeks but um but yeah this is a really good way for them to see uh, exactly what's going on and and then also you know we're giving them each week a just a, a, a little bit of extra information on a particular detail uh, whether it be you know last week we spoke about the bunker edge construction which you know, a little bit unique to the sand belt, these these firm packed edges and with the sharp sharp bunker corners. Um, uh, you know, just just trying to understand, you know, how how we make that happen and, and how how it's a little bit unique to the sand belt. So we you know, we try and give them something interesting with the with the piece as well. And that communication you're sending out is that something that you've brought in, or is the club always sent out? regular communications on the course i know it's a bit unique now with the project going on but uh yeah look it's, it's something we've done for the project um you know, course up video um updates on the course by video not not something we've done a lot on a regular basis um from time to time it will be done uh but certainly with projects yeah week, weekly update leading up to these we, we did shoot a series of videos which which were a little bit longer but that was sort of that seven eight minute mark but you know that was introducing the projects and the need uh, and the need for doing the projects and and all the reasons why which you know that's a it's a significant capital investment um um being made of uh, the members' money, so we certainly needed to go into a, a reasonable level of detail. But um, 
you know, we've got some great members within the club uh, that were really helpful in in um, being the the interviewers for for these these video segments that we did. Um, yeah, we uh, and and the people that we used to, they were fantastic about and also about adding a bit of humour to it, Ed, as well. I think uh, we always talk about clubs and you know it's important in clubs. We did a member survey recently, and and um, I guess no surprise, but you know, the reason why members are um, join a golf club is for fun and enjoyment. So um, yeah, so we you know we always got to try and come back to that, and that's what we tried to do with our videos is make them lighthearted, yes, serious subject matter, but at the same time. You know, let's let's try and deliver it with a with a sense of humour and and fun. Do you feel video communication with the membership now is going to be more the way to go? Complemented, I'm sure, with some written stuff as well. But do you find the memberships, especially maybe the younger ones, also yeah. really prefer the video? Yeah, absolutely. I think. Um, look, I, there's always it always has to be supported by detail in the background, whether it's you know. Certainly, you know, your annual report that's certainly got a lot of detail, but any project needs to have a lot of detail. For the, for those that have got an interest in consuming all that information, you know, we need to make sure that we're answering all the questions that they may have um, because, you know, otherwise it has the risk of, you know, just breeding discussion of, um, you know, things that will be inaccurate and might cause concern amongst the members. So, yeah, we need to ensure we're providing that level of detail. But, um, yeah, we're still trying to find the right balance of how we do that. But, you know, where we can, I think uh, our go-to is, you know, short video communication, but then, you know, linked in with that, you know, attachments and, and documents that, that can support the messages within the video. And then if, if those that want to go off and consume it, they can. Um, those that don't want to, they, they can they can just ignore it. But as long as we're getting the key messages across to the to the broader membership. And with the either the project update videos or just generally for the club, is this something that you just keep internally with the membership or do you also push it out on social media to a wider audience? Yeah, we, yeah, it's a good question, and we, we, we haven't as yet. Um, we, when I say we haven't, we, we, we fed out some drone imagery, um, which are, which are extracts from the, from the member videos, and we, and we put out a couple of little, um, bits out to, you know, through the, through the social channels that we do have, um, for the general public. But, um, yeah, our, our attention will turn to, you know, how we communicate and what we communicate to, to the, to the, general public it's um it'll be a little bit different but you know we you know certainly cognizant of members have the ability of forwarding on information to to others and it, and it can leak out um organically that way but uh for, for commonwealth and where we're going and, and doing the projects well the project over two stages we we're, we're, we're going to be holding a little bit until next year and and that's when we'll, we'll start, certainly start to ramp up our communication to the to the broader industry um to try and uh, unlock that hidden gem tag that I spoke about a little bit earlier, and uh, and and really put Commonwealth on the map as a as a as a brilliant sandbelt golf course. And do you have a a metric as to what you want to reach to kind of know that you've got that tag away? Will that just be kind of a feeling of that's not being mentioned or written about as a hidden gem, or will you base that on? Any course rankings moving up in that? The, the course rankings, yeah, you know, that, that whatever happens will, with that, then you know, that's that's where you will will accept that. And you certainly expect it, the, the course to be recognised um, to a higher standard, than it, well, at, a, at a higher ranking than what it is at the moment. But that's yeah, that's for others to to decide. But look, uh, the, the measure of success. Um, I think uh, you know, come off in it from a membership point of view, we're we're, we're solid membership, strong, um, uh, and you know, I've got a small wait list, and you know that that will, I think the measure will be the you know, the interest in membership and also the interest in in visitor play. Like like all the Sandbelt clubs, we are open to to visitor play from interstate and international visitors, uh, and and I guess also it's the members bringing guests to the club. So that will be the key things that we'll look to to say, well, you know, have we succeeded or or not um, with this project? So yeah, it'll 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 take a little bit of time, but I certainly expect the interest to be there uh, as soon as we've completed the works in early twenty twenty four. But 
I guess the, uh, the other measure of success is, is ensuring that that's, there's that sustainable interest. Um, yeah, I hope to be having good problems in the future, Ed, where, um, you know, we're, we're, we're too busy and, you know, we, we, we're struggling to accommodate, um, yeah, new members and, uh, and, and, and the, the visit of golf where, you know, we're, we're having to, to curb it a little bit because it's, uh, we've got such high demand. So, yeah. We'll, we'll see where we land, but like I said, I'm I'm really confident with the with the product that we're that we're starting to build. It certainly sounds very exciting. Having played the course once myself, I know it's such a lovely layout already. So it will only improve, I'm sure, with these works going on and new greens irrigation system giving you the control of the condition of the surface and few few redesigns. So it sounds an exciting time for the club moving forwards. So. With Cornwell, you you have been a member there for quite a long time. Correct. Yes. Yes. Since two thousand and four, November two thousand and four, I joined the club. So, how has that transition been from being a member, knowing the staff and membership, with that relationship, to now being the general manager and having quite a different relationship with people you, you already know? Have there been or have been the key challenges, and the were there any that you weren't expecting when you came in yeah um yeah it's not it's not normal Ed, i'm sure i'm sure yeah you, you certainly understand that it doesn't doesn't happen that often where a member of the club uh, ends up becoming the general manager but um or well, it might have been common actually probably 70 80 years ago but <laughs> as a secretary yeah. manager so, so maybe we're taking a step back in time uh look it hasn't hasn't been a problem at all ed to be honest um you know, we, uh, you know, I guess took took my member hat off. Well, I sort of half wear it. Um, you know, I, you know, my passion for seeing these projects through and being successful, and and but more broadly seeing Commonwealth uh, as good as it can be. Um, you know, so there's, it burns a little bit through through being a member of the club and having experienced it, and um, and I guess also knowing what it could become, having been. Uh, you know, further down the road at uh, at Metropolitan, and um, and seeing you know how how Metropolitan operated, um, yeah, which which had a, a you know an advantage over Commonwealth through the um, ultimately due to the investment in their facilities and, and primarily their you know their golf course and their surfaces that they that they had. So um, so so I guess back to to the to the point of um you know, the change. It look it hasn't been too bad I, for, for me yet. I was um I was a really you know, I was a relatively active member in my younger days of membership. But um at first child born in two thousand and ten, and uh, and then at that stage um, I quickly um shortly after went to a a, a lesser playing category um. Yeah, I think my, me and my wife. I think early days, you know, before marriage, you know, we used to, I used to say, "Oh, it's one thing I'll never give up, and that's my golf membership." And then, yeah, as soon as the first child arrived, things things changed rapidly. So, so that being the case, just being um, you know, being a what was it, what was we call a restricted member, I was I was only visiting the club twice, three times, four times a year uh, max. Um, uh, probably visit it more often when I was going there for a meeting, as um, you know, to you know, catching up with the you know, as as we do between clubs and and general managers, just to um, you know, share ideas. So probably spent more time at the club in 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 that in that medium rather than being as a as a playing member. So yeah, so I was a little bit removed, but having said that, yeah, like I said the passion was still there. So yeah, look, we you know, so sort of really just come with the mindset. You know, my role is yes, I'm the, I'm the general manager. Um, you know, I understand that. I, I know my responsibilities as as an employee of the club, as the general manager, and um, you know, really just just push on on those on that basis. But at, yeah, the positive has been is that you know I know the course really really well, and um, I know when I started Metropolitan, I think I'd only played there three or four times, and I you know, felt like I was you know you know bit distance with a lot of the conversations when it came to the golf course and elements of the golf course and probably took me about, you know, a good six months to get up to speed with those sorts of things, which, you know, I certainly didn't have that issue mm-hmm. at Commonwealth. So it was really handy coming in so close to the major project starting and um, and just knowing the, the course property really, really well, um, knowing knowing the club well in terms of its history. Um, 
but even that's been pleasing too. Now as a as a GM, I've had a little bit more time to you know, do a bit more of a deep dive and really understand and appreciate um, the history of the Commonwealth Golf Club as well. Do you feel then that having that passion for the club, being a member there, and if anything like me, whenever you go to another golf club or even a restaurant, you can't help but look around and see what could be done differently and improved. I think that's a, a big part of the, the passion behind taking this job and really wanting to, to push the club forward with that. Yeah, it was. Yeah, look, and, and I am, um, uh, and I observed probably in recent years that um, yeah, that the club was actually on the right path and uh, in its planning for doing the works that it's now doing. So you know, as a as a member, I was you know really pleased that you know they'd, they'd done a number of things and. Um, and position themselves financially to to be in a position to do these major works. So it was it was really um, it was nice to see that you know there's there's good things happening at the club. And then yeah, it just coincided that uh, this opportunity arose uh, when the when the position became vacant. Uh, and um, yeah, and I had a you know beautiful tenure at Metro, loved it. But yeah, to to see this pre-planning and organisation and opportunity to get involved and, and execute projects and yeah, get Commonwealth where it needs to get to, it was, it, was, it was pretty exciting. Anything else on the course project that you want to add about what's been going on or you feel you've fairly well covered that? Oh, I think so, yeah. Okay, great. So I'll go on to a few other questions more sure. about um, see you as a club manager. What behavior or belief have you changed in the past say five years that has positively impacted your personal or professional life so for for me i used to always think that before i could implement an idea or process it would have to be a hundred percent ready to go before I, i felt comfortable with it but then i was playing golf with a mentor of mine and we were still in this elevated tee box looking down at the fairway with hands both sides and we've been discussing this and he looked at me and they said, you have to pull the trigger on 80% or be ready to, and then iterate up to where you want to, because it will never be a hundred percent before you want to. Uh, and that was based on his experience of going through a acquisition of a business. And that's something that's really, I've changed in myself of being more comfortable with something, not quite being a hundred percent and then iterating it and found that's made, decision making a lot quicker for myself i'm going to steal that ed thank you um uh yeah look i think for, think for me probably the the changes and and um you know it was probably it was probably and through it through a tenure of a, of a nine year stint at, at, at metro was it um yeah well, it was actually you know learning to let go and and just empower people and um which you know, I was not to say I was ever um, bad at that, but I, you know, certainly, um, you know, relinquished more and more, and uh, and really encouraged, you know, people to people to take those responsibilities on, and you know, and back them to just just make make decisions, and then you know, advise me after the fact, um, you know, rather than you know, checking off too many things sometimes. And and I think look, that comes with trust, and you know, working with people for a period of time, and I had a. You know, fairly stable team, but yeah, you know, I think that's something for me is learn and learning is that you got to ensure that I've got a team around me that, uh, and I get to that position as quick as I can uh, to ensure that you know the the club can thrive. So we, we've got people that are that are engaged, empowered, and you know, and, and accepting responsibility because they they've got ownership and um, and that we can move quicker to um, to get things done and in, and enhance services and and deliver on the, the wanted experiences of members. It's always one of those challenges when you go from being like the star employee and you do everything and that's how you achieve to then being the leader where you need to empower everybody else to do that. And that yeah, initial bit of letting go of that certainly can be a challenge. What advice do you think your 10-year-older self would give you now? Oh, uh, yeah, I know what it is, but... Uh... Would have been spend more time with your family. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I think. But I think. I think. I think everyone says that. But, yeah. Um, yeah. Well, that's a good one. That's uh, certainly an important part of balancing the challenges of a 
rewarding job, but what can be time consuming and tough finding that balance to spend time with family, uh, especially with, with kids. Yeah. Yeah. I think, um, Oh, yeah. I mean, that's a good question, Ed. I hope it's, you know, and one of the things I hope it's, you know, it's not something along the lines of, you know, you're, you're, you know, you're a dinosaur and too slow to adapt or something like that. But, um, yeah, <laughs> I, I, um, yeah, it's something I certainly pride myself on just trying to, well, not pride myself on, you know, work hard at to try and stay, you know, relevant and in the day. But, um, yeah. I have to take that on notice, and I might have to maybe come back to that, Ed, if I can. That's okay, no problem at all. So, how do you give feedback? So, can you give an example of when someone's disappointed you in your team and how you handled that? If you can like, paint a picture of the situation, uh, with obviously anonymously, uh, of what happened and, and how you handled that. Yeah, look d- directly, Ed. I'm, you know, I, I, I try and deal with these things as quick as I can, and um, you know, I'm honest. Uh, you know, look people in the eye, tell them I've, I've you know, I'm, I'm here to help. I'm here to support. Um, which, yeah, and, and it's, it's, you know, like I said that it comes back to the honesty. Um, you know, I, yeah, I'd rather tell people, talk to the people that I need to talk to about, you know, something that they're not quite doing right rather than talk to you know five or five or six other people about it so um yeah just being honest and have that quick conversation deal with it as quick as we can um and and then also you know just you know ask their perspective of of, of things and you know what what i could be doing to help them or, or what you know we could be doing in the environment to to help them but um yeah like i said just addressing things as as quick as we can and and you know taking the time to explain to them if we need to in more detail as to you know if they don't quite understand why um uh you know you know, go to that effort so they know exactly why you know they need to change what they do or you know why they should have done something differently and um yeah and just help them through that what's a big passion of yours within club management and the golf industry in australia I know at Metropolitan you brought in some great initiatives to increase the number of women in golf at the club and it, and in general, obviously not just yourself but the whole team. Can is there anything that you're really passionate about wanting to improve or change and and why do you care about it and when did you start feeling that? The women thing was um yeah, so it was really, really rewarding. Uh, we were we were awarded visionary of the month uh, by golf australia for for some of the programs that we we established and um yeah more importantly it uh yeah it has a positive impact it changes the environment enhances the environment when you've got a you know a good mix of, of male and, and, and female um so you know that was that was certainly rewarding i think um yeah, and that was for you know amongst and and there are things that came out through strategic planning at, at, at Metropolitan, and that's something that was really important to that to that club. I think, um, and we're about to go through that process at, at at Commonwealth for our next strategic plan, and you know that might be one of the things that, that come out. So for me, the the reward is um, you know again looking at things now from a Commonwealth perspective is is just having um, you know Commonwealth members being really proud of. Um, being a member of Commonwealth, you know, that that's probably the you know the the big motivation for me at, at this stage. And it's not to say members of Commonwealth aren't proud, but you know I think it's um, you know certainly there's, there's another another level we can get to. So that's that's a big motivator for me um, to try and to try and deliver on that for the members in the short term, and then and then any other things that fall within that strategic plan, but. Yeah, you know, having a strong, vibrant club um, that people want to be a part of, then uh, yeah, it's it's a they, they're they're pretty special places to work in, Ed. As I'm sure you know, when um, when you know, a member walks through the door and they brought a guest in, and they're just really proud to show off their club to to their guests. You know, you, you get a nice warm feeling, particularly when you've delivered a, a you, know, you and your team have delivered a good service at, at the end of the day. Yeah, it sounds like then that. That member experience and, and that joy you give them that's what gets you out of bed when that alarm clock goes off yeah yeah spot on and, and look probably another part too is that and that's the probably second part is is you know seeing my team members you know being successful in what they want to do as well and and seeing their career develop and grow i think um 
you know, a, a, my operations manager at, at Metropolitan, um, you know, secured a general manager's job over in New Zealand last year. And, you know, seeing those sorts of things happen is, um, yeah, is, is really rewarding. Um, and, uh, yeah, there's, there, there's certainly things that you are. Uh, it goes back to the, the discussion we had before about, you know, teams and managing teams and, and um, you know, having those honest conversations so they can grow and develop. And then, yeah, there's a there's a, a lot of positivity that comes from um, others, yeah, you know, people in your team succeeding. What's one of the best pieces of advice you've been given in your career and that maybe now you still reflect back on and, and use? Yeah, I think look, probably my, in my hospitality days, I got some nice candid advice. Um, and that was, you know, when I was, and I probably haven't lost it all, Ed, but, um, you know, I can be pretty passionate at times and um, and maybe, you know, too passionate. And that sometimes, you know, my passion and, and desire and, uh, you know, may not match what other people think about things. And um, so, yeah, so that, that was probably something that I need to learn and understand and manage is that, yeah, what I might see is something that's really important and, and a standard that I might, you know, be chasing, um, you know, might not be on, you know, others might not be on the same page and, you know, and then for good reason, you know, I might not be, you know, may not be right. So it's just, um, you know, I think having, you know, greater awareness of, you know, of others and their views on things, mm-hmm. I think, um, you know, that's probably a, you know, some, some good advice that I got early days and certainly still carry with me today. The one final question, on the back of clubs generally around the world are, are struggling a bit with recruiting people, what's one message you'd send to anyone who's maybe thinking of joining the club industry or if there's any ways you've tried to address any recruitment struggles you have had that you've found have been useful? Yeah, it's, it's a bit tough at the moment, certainly. And I think, um, again, I'm going to get back to fun and enjoyment. It's why our members... You know, come to our club it's and it's you know it's very much why um, employees will stay I think you know there's that that opportunity to develop yes um, which I think you know we need to provide as an industry so we need to provide a professional workplace um, you know a team that's dedicated to supporting each other helping each other to achieve goals that are greater you know whether it's within the club or outside of the club so I think you know that's important but that's for, you know, for those that are not looking for career as you know, they don't have great career aspirations apart from, you know, just having a place where they can enjoy going to work, um, then yeah, you need to make it fun and enjoyable and, and, you know, show that you really appreciate what they do. So um, it's just having, you know, taking sufficient time in the day, you know, where you can to, to you know, spend that time with them. And, um, yeah, and certainly not to say at um I think all managers would say, I wish, wish we allocated more time to do that and, and, and we're better at it. But um, I think those little things are, are important. Um, yeah, if, you, if, you're not, if you're not having fun at work, um, then uh, yeah, it can be, can be pretty pretty tough gig and, um, and I think uh, some people will, will look for uh, alternate options. So it comes back to the club industry and then you go, well, yeah, we ask the question, well, you know, benefits of the club industry, why the club industry will... Yeah, that combination of, you know, and, and generally, you know, 90, 98% of the members are, you know, are there for, for that and, um, you know, they're, they're there to, to have a, a good time, um, you know, in good spirits, good humour. Um, so that's a great that's a great place to go and work. Um, you know, I, um, yeah, I, I, you know, where I can, you know, I love getting out and talking to the members and, you um, you know, I might get caught up on something that's got a lot of detail, or or maybe even getting some feedback from a member that may not be too positive about you know something that we're doing. Um, I, I tend to always try and balance it out with you know go out to the lounge and talk to you know a dozen members and you know see how they're going, get their feedback on things, and um, and invariably I go back to the office with a clear head and you know and a positive mindset and I can deal with that that you know that feedback that's been given um accordingly but um yeah it's uh you know that's just an example of you know I guess what the club industry can do and the environment it can provide um so yeah and I think and more broadly too it's you know we're, we're a very you know, loyal and supportive industry so it's a yeah it's a it's a great place to to work and you know and a career to date that I've really 
really, really enjoyed and um, and so glad that I made the switch from from hospitality to, to clubs. Yeah, definitely. It's, you find the right club and it's a great fun environment to work in with great people and yeah, that's a huge part of it. People are going to be, especially in the, maybe more the F&B side of clubs, it can be, I mean, all of it can be tough, but they're especially so. And yeah, if you're making that a fun environment for them, they're going to enjoy it more for sure. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I want to be respectful of your time with me today, Pete. Thank you for joining me. It's been a real pleasure having this conversation. Is there any final message you want to pass on to the listeners or? Oh, no, look, no, no, enjoyed, enjoyed the chat. It's, uh, it's nice to talk about what's happening at Commonwealth. Uh, like I said, it's, uh, it's a really, really exciting time. And, um, yeah, I really look forward to having you out at um, when you can make it back to Australia and uh, hosting you for a game of golf and, um, yeah, get out and enjoy the new course. Yeah, definitely. I look forward to that. I haven't uh, played the original one as it was a few years ago. I look forward to coming out and having a game with you. Thank you for joining me on this journey as we dive into the world of club management. I hope you enjoy listening to these conversations as much as I enjoy having them. If you do enjoy and get value from them, I have two small requests. Simply subscribe to the show on your favourite podcast listening app and leave a review and share it directly with someone whom you think would benefit from listening. If you're interested in being a guest on this show yourself, then you can reach out to me using the details in the show notes or email me modernclubmanagement at pm.me. In the show notes, you will also find a link to my bi-weekly newsletter that complements these conversations where you can sign up to receive these directly into your inbox so that you never miss out. Thanks for tuning in and have an amazing day.